distinguished scholars and speakers, honorable guests, and of course, all professors and who take profession in advocating the whole idea of sustainability and sustainable development, and all ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my humble honor to have been invited to be in the presence of distinguished expertise of sustainable development to deliver an opening address at this very august gathering. So I am truly grateful to the co-round table, Stephen Young, TSDF, and Sassin for this honorable invitation. Being among expertise on sustainable development, I doubt about my own presence here because, of course, I'm the only one, even in a costume, is alien to every one of you. I wouldn't announce myself as an expert on the subject, yet I'm invited to give an opening address. I just hope that you are not taking me as a symbol of a sacred blessing for this significant symposium. Because I remember that when I was still a young monk, I was here in this very building for the opening ceremony of Sassin with His Holiness, the Supreme Patriarch. So this is my second time. I'm not doing the same job of blessing this place. Comparing with all distinguished scholars who are I guess you are the change agent of this modern world. I'm just a simple Buddhist monk who have been living under Buddhist discipline for over 40 years. In other words, I'm alien to secular world, which you are very familiar with. And I guess that your secular world is directly run by the power of greed and consumption. The only relevancy of my being here with all the distinguished scholar would be the very word sustainability. Because it is considered that life of a true Theravada Buddhist monk like me is operated under the principle of a holistic sustainability. Here, I'm going to share with you how I view concept of sustainability based on my own way of living under precepts of Buddhist teachings. However, this doesn't mean that I'm going to deliver a Buddhist sermon or religious dogma here. Sustainable, sustainability, or sustainable development, sustainable development, it's becoming a fringy word. It's becoming a trendy word. So no one would argue against me if I say that this decade is a decade of sustainable de development. We have been hearing about sustainable in every field till I feel sometime that we overuse the term sustainability. Sometimes I personally feel that I'm allergic to this term sustainable, which really made me think hard before I accept the invitation to speak today. I'm getting allergic not because I am against the popular idea behind sustainability. I see it as another fancy term to add on to our modern conversation. These days, if you don't add the term sustainable into your business, plan, policies, or even a public speeches, you become someone from the distant past. Of course, no one wants to, no one wants to hold on the Flintstone age. Therefore, sustainability becomes our modern mantra of this decade. It was only 28 years ago that the United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development released the report, Our Common Future. The report included what is now one of the most widely 
recognize definitions of sustainable development. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. As a footnote, this is the same time that UNESCO proposed another solution for degrading world by presenting another term of cultural development. However, UNESCO's term was not successful as United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development. Therefore, the concept of sustainable development won over cultural development since then. Sustainable development therefore involves at least three areas. A broad view of social, environmental, and economic outcomes. A long-term perspective concerned with the interests and the rights of future generations as well as of people today. An inclusive approach to action which recognizes the need for all people to be involved in the decisions that affect their lives. Sustainable development is not just the responsibility of environmental specialists or communication professionals. It requires contribution from people across all functions of an organization. But what does this mean? What are the needs of the present? Take a minute and jot down five or ten needs that you have in your own life. Have you listed any needs that conflict with one another? For example, if you listed clean air to breathe, but also listed a car for transportation, your needs might conflict. Which would you choose? And how would you make your decision? If within ourselves, we have conflicting needs, how much is that multiplied when we look at the whole community, city, nation, and world? For example, what happens when a company's need for a cheap labor conflicts with workers' need for livable wages? Or when individual families' needs for firewood conflict with the need to prevent erosion and conserve of topsoils? Or when one country's need for electricity results in acid rain that damages another country's lakes and rivers. How do we decide whose needs are met? Poor or rich people? Citizens or immigrants? People living in cities or in the countryside? People in the country or another? If you, you or your neighbor, the environment or the corporation? This generation of the next gen this generation or the next generations. When there has to be a trade-off, whose needs should go first? People concerned about sustainable development suggest that meeting the needs of the future depends on how well we balance social, economic, and environmental objectives or needs. When making decisions today, isn't that sustainability we are talking about? What social, economic, and environmental needs would you add to the puzzle? Many of these objectives may seem to conflict with each other in the short term. For example, industrial growth might conflict with preserving natural resources. Yet in the long term, responsible use of natural resources now will help ensure that there are resources available for sustained industrial growth far into the future. Studying the puzzle raises a number of different questions. For example, can the long-term economic objective of sustained agricultural growth be met if the ecological objective of preserving biodiversity is not? What happens? to the environment in the long term if a large number of people cannot afford to meet their basic household needs today, if you did not have access to safe water, and therefore needed wood to boil drinking water so that you and your children would, get, would not get sick? Would you worry about causing deforestation? 
or if you had to drive a long distance to get to work each day, would you be willing to move or to get a new job to avoid polluting the air with your car exhaust if it don't balance our social, economic, and environmental objectives in the short term? How can we expect to sustain our development in the long term? Talking about my own experiences recently, I was in Nepal helping out the poor people who is devastated with the result of the, the earthquake. And all those dead, suddenly in a one minute shake, 800 thousand households has collapsed. And because of their economic conditions and because of their political bureaucracy, nobody helped them. What can they do? All the roads are blocked. All the houses gone. The sick and the one who injures are there. No one there to help. So what we do in that circumstances? Do we still think of a living of a sustainability there or to solve the problem where they are facing very drastically there? I was there and trying to give them a help. And my help was at least how do we give a temporary shelter? I asked it, do they have a bamboo there? Do you have a whatever available in the forest or whatever? I said that forget about deforestation at the moment. People are in their suffering. They are in a bad shape. You need to save your life first. You need to save humanity first. So when you're talking about the sustainable development dilemmas, do you and your family face in your everyday lives? I'm sure that we can't run away from the bombarding concept of sustainability in our age. Many have already well developed the idea and considered to be the sacred mantra of this age. As a result, they respectfully place it on an altar and worship it as a modern philosophy. This simply means that they are good at praising and talking, not applying it to the business and life. Isn't that what we call philosophy all about? Feeling good and good for quoting, but for far away from making it happen in life. For example, I'm sure that we are all familiar with the His Majesty's idea on sufficiency economy. A wise wisdom from His Majesty King of Thailand to solve a modern bad economy. But we praised and respect His Majesty's good wishes so much that now we place it on the altar and we respectfully renamed it as a philosophy of sufficiency economy. All national policies and every business sectors claim that their policies and business are guided under the philosophy of sufficiency economy by His Majesty. I questioned this practice, do we really mean it or put sufficiency economy into action? Of course, the term is there as a sacred mantra. In everything what government or corporation claim they do, we are respectfully taking a good advice from His Majesty King to be a philosophy, although the King himself never presented it as a philosophy in his royal speeches and uses. We hardly walk the talk of sustainable living and promoting the development of healthy communities. Therefore, indeed in general terms, I do have a problem with the modern uses of the term sustainability. Let me draw some problems from its wider uses definition. Undoubtedly, this is the economic age and accordingly the idea behind sustainability is economy. In this age of environmental loss and degradation, the main concern of modern economy suddenly shifted to environment. Consequently, we gave birth to a neologism like green economy. Suddenly, it became a fashionable term to use adjective green for everything. To go, to, to go with the trend, there even came a Buddhist book entitled The Green Buddha. Or Green Buddha became another synonyms 
of sustainability. I'm glad that I didn't have to wear the green robe as well. What I understand of modern sustainability is simple marriage between development and environment. On one hand, economy and ecology in another hand. The crucial point of this is how do we master environment and ecology as a vital factor of development and economy. Therefore, under popular definition of sustainability, it emphasizes on how do we compromise the needs of the present and future generations. Please focus on the term compromise. An English dictionary defines it simply as settlement of a dispute by concession of both or all sides. In another word, it is to make a mutual promise. In this case, promise what? We promise that we will consume less for the benefit of our future generations. Sounds perfect, isn't it? But is that possible at all with unlimited human greed? I see that sustainability is dealing with impossible. Because from a Western approach, human needs and greed is natural. Human is a master of everything in this world. Every resources in this world is there for human consumption. Therefore, the most we can do is to compromise our natural greed and desire. I personally can't accept this as a, uh, I personally can't accept this. As Buddhism sees that world from totally different perspective under the law of interdependence. Human is not the master of this earth. Human is a small part of this global earth and we live under the law of interdependency. We are human because there is another human being to interact with. Imagine if there is a, no other human being. Would we be a human? Our life is supported equally by environment and it is human task to keep environment intact for sustainable sustainability of humanity and the world. Therefore, I don't see the holistic, integrated and balanced idea behind the popular idea of sustainability. Popular sustainability misses the ability of human being in training oneself not to be a part of the problem. Buddha said, human desire should be studied and restrained not to compromise with it. Therefore, we have to reflect our views and perceptions. We have to change the way we see, the, we see and utilize the world. We have to learn and train how to fix our desire in the first place, rather than compromise with our desire against others. On the contrary, I'm so glad that this phenomena is changing gradually by hardworking and new understanding of co-roundtable and other working partners agencies. To be honest, I love the way the organizer of this symposium phrases the importance of the sustainability for modern world in the proposed agenda. Let me repeat here once again. Sustainable development will further demand activation of ethical perspectives, giving new scope to value-based consideration of personal meaning and rectitude in our lives. Sustainable development must become second nature to us all. Sustainability will become more than a philosophy. It will become our habitual behavior and a way of thinking about creation and our role in the future evolution of life systems, societies, and culture. It will flourish best where our minds are clear and alert and when our judgment embraces all that surrounds us. From a Buddhist background, I see this is a Buddhist text. This is what Buddha said all about. Developing the knowledge of sustainable development as a philosophy is one of my fears always haunt me when I speak of sustainability or even other popular concept of a sufficiency economy. 
Personally, I do not want to see it as a philosophy, but a practical solution of the facing problem. I guess I have a problem because I myself being an anthropologist, so I am attacking here the field of philosophy, I guess. This reminds me of the virtue of the Dharma, which most Buddhists, if you are Thais, they are very familiar and they chant without a proper understanding. For example, one of the phrases they chant in their daily chanting of the most Buddhists in Thailand and many other Theravada countries is the virtue of the Dhamma, which goes, Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditiko Akaliko Ehi Pasiko Opanaiko Pachatang Vedi Tabbo Vinyo Hiti. These Pali words, for one who doesn't understand, it's become a sacred mantra. But if you know the language, it is giving the same idea just the way you have, put, you have phrased in your agenda. What does it mean? It means the Dhamma. The Dhamma in Buddhism means that the truth. The truth means that the one which uphold the things. This is a flower because there's uh, so many things come together to make it flower. So if these things, ingredients, sort of uh, disintegrated, the flower is gone. So the nature of putting things together and make things this and that, that is uh, all about the dharma, the which upholds. So the dharma has a virtues, or the character of the dharma are, there are six. The one is, Visible here and now. Sanditiko, visible here and now. The second, immediately effective. All those teachings have to be effective immediately. There is a no rely on the time, space, culture, whatever. Inviting one to come and see, leading onwards, and to realize by reward each for himself. So imagine, this is the very word most of Buddhists, they chant every day. If you go to the Buddhist temple, every morning and every evening. Teaching yourself, how should you take the idea, the value of the truth, and how do you adapt it in your life? So I would like to suggest, basically, is that the sustainable development should be developed in the same matter, in the same way just as a dharma, where the subject of sus sustainability is clearly visible here and now, both in theory and practice. Sometimes we are so good in theory, but when you put into practice, it fails. That is what we call sanditiko. You can see for, your, for yourself. It should have a nature of universality, akaliko. No boundaries of cultures, Time, religion, and geographical differences. It should be the subject of critical analysis where we can invite anyone to explore about it. Ehi pasiko. Ehi, come here, pasiko, look at it. So you should be able to debate on it. But there should be no dogmas on that. But if you keep on only debating and debating and debating, what will happen? you will develop that debate into a philosophy. You will have a fun. You will be enjoying in debating. And then you lost the whole value of it. It's become a philosophy. That's why Buddha says that whatever you talk about this truth, whatever you talk about this solution, it has to be open, it has to be leading on, it has to be act upon, it has to be what you said, it can be done. And that is the nature of a Buddha himself. Yathawadi tathakari. What I said is what I do. What I do is what I said. So if you have that sort of uh, open naiko element in the development, then the last thing which will happen is that sustainability should encompass the quality that could be realized by each and every one who leads one's life with sustainability. In this way, 
we don't need to convince anyone to live a life of sustainability, but invite them to try and see for themselves the pro and con of sustainability. The people will realize by themselves, therefore I see the concept of sustainability as a truly more than mantras of, or it is indeed a secularization of very Buddhist Dharma itself. Unfortunately, so far it became just like a good Buddhist chanting, which turned to be a sacred mantra for most people who even hardly try to know what they were uttering when they chanted. Sustainability is falling on the same trap. Everyone has their own way of interpreting the sustainability and may use it in their daily conversation even without knowing what they are talking all about, your distinguished scholars. You would be surprised if I tell you that the modern secular concept of sustainability and sustainable development has been a part of a daily conversation in Buddhist society from the ancient time long ago. A few days ago, when Stephen dropped in my temple to see me, to visit me. We have very nice conversations. And after Stephen left my place, it lingering my thought about what Stephen has said. And then suddenly something came out of my thought is that in fact the sustainability, the sustainable development, development is a heart and sort of a, it is a heart of all Buddhist teachings. In Pali conversation, the language spoken by the Buddha, I remember that when I was a small novice, I always hear the seniors for like the present, the Supreme Patriot who passed away, when he meet with the Sri Lankan monk or the Burmese monk who is elderly, he doesn't know English. They speak each other in a Pali language, the language spoken by Buddha. And when they started the, the conversation, they usually started generally, as, you, as we always do, how are you? Kamaniyang, how are you? The typical answer is Kamaniyang and Yap or Yapaniyang, or sometimes both Kamaniyang and Yapaniyang. Surprisingly, the term Kamaniyang in Pali means bearable, which was initial etymology, it, uh, initial etymological meaning of sustainable. Whereas Yapaniyang means sufficient for being supporting one's life. Therefore, in a Buddhistic way, when you were asked, how are you? The answer is unlike our popular phrase, okay, I am fine, thank you, something like that. No, the response would be, I am sustainable. It reflects the balance of physical and mental situations of a human. It simply says, I am at ease mentally and sustainable in living. Or in other words, I'm happy. Isn't it ultimate goal of human life to be a happy? However, according to the Jingmi Thingle, former prime minister of royal government of Bhutan, clearly stated that happiness has nothing to do with the common use of that word to denote an ephemeral passing mood, happy today or unhappy tomorrow, due to some temporary external condition like praise or blame, gain or loss. Rather, it refers to deep abiding happiness that comes from living life in full harmony with the natural world, with our communities, and with our cultural and spiritual heritage. And from knowing the trust and from and from knowing and trusting that we care for the common good. In short, from feeling totally connected with our world. That is the happiness. And yet our modern world, and particularly its economic system, promote precisely the reverse. A profound sense of alienation from the natural world and from each other cherishing self-interest and material gain, 
we destroy nature, degrade our natural and cultural heritage, disrespect indigenous knowledge, overwork, get stressed out, and no longer have time to enjoy each other's company, let alone to contemplate and meditate on life's deeper meaning. Myriad scholarly studies now shows that massive gain in GDP and income have not made us happier. On the contrary, respected economists have demonstrated empirically that deep social networks are a far better predictor of satisfaction and well-being than, incoming, than income and material gain. And here we come, this technology, trying to put everyone together, having a social networking, even created what we call very familiar word, Facebook. But alas, with this, all this technology, we are keeping, we are kept apart. Although it is called Facebook, we don't have, we don't have our real face on it. I noticed that when people go to the restaurant, they come in a pair, they come in a couple, holding hand each other's in a romantic way. As soon as they sat for the menu, and they look at the menu, and they order the food, while they're waiting for food, all their faces are gone. Their faces are squared. Each other's, they don't talk. What is the point of going to have dinner, have lunch together, if they are not enjoying the company of each other? But they are enjoying the virtual company of someone who doesn't have a face. So this is what happened with the word happiness here. It is significant that the term gross national happiness was first coined in direct contrast with gross national product. Literally, as a sharp critic of our current materialistic obsession and growth-based economic system. And it is even more significant that the statement was not made in relation to Bhutan alone, but as a universal proclamation, true for the world and for all beings. The time has come to build new economic system that truly reflects that universal consensus. It will be economic system that is no longer based on the dangerous illusion that limitless growth is possible on our precious and finite planet or that endless material gain promotes well-being. Instead, it will be a system that promotes harmony and respect for nature and for each other, that respects our ancient wisdom, traditions, and protects our most unvaluable people as our own family, and that gives us time to live and enjoy our li lives and to appreciate rather than destroy our world. It will be an economic system, in short, that is fully sustainable and that is rooted in true abiding happiness and well-being. Sustainability is the essential basis and preconditions of such a same economic system. But an economy exists not for mere survival, but to provide the enabling condition for human happiness and the well-being of all life forms. The new economy will be an economy based on genuine vision of life's ultimate meaning and purpose, an economy that does not cut us off from nature and community, but fosters true human potential, fulfillment, and satisfaction. Therefore, when you announce that you abide by a value of sustainability. In a Buddhist interpretation, it covers the whole lifestyle, not only your health and economy. If I put it into context, you have to be sustainable in perceptions, thought, speech, action, economy, diligence, conscience, and determination. Simply, it is known in Buddhist terminology as Noble Eightfold Path. It is also known as the Middle Path, the very root of the sufficiency economy. In other words, to act towards sustainable development 
indeed is to lead a life of a Buddhist. However, not in a religious sense, but a universal practical solution. For a record, Buddhism never limited its copyright only to Buddhists. Once the Buddha was asked, is that possible for other faith believers to reach nirvana? Buddha's answer was simple. He says, whoever leads a life according to the middle path, regardless of their belief, they surely can reach nirvana, the ultimate sustainable happy life. Unlike Christian heaven, Muslim heaven, Buddhist heaven are open for all. This Buddhist notion of sustainability should be a foundation of a universal secular sustainable development, a synonym of sufficient economy, a sufficient economy. As His Majesty King of Thailand once clarifies, sufficient economy is a principle that stresses the middle path as an overriding principle for appropriate conduct by the populace at all levels. This applies to conduct starting from the level of the families, communities, as well as the level of nation in development and administration, so as to modernize in line with the forces of globalization. Sufficiency means moderation, reasonableness, and the need of self-immunity for sufficient protection from impact arising from internal and external changes. To achieve this, an application of knowledge with due consideration and prudence is essential. In particular, great care is needed in the utilization of theories and methodologies for planning and implementation in every step. At the same time, it is essential to strengthen the moral fiber of the nation so that everyone, particularly public, officials, academics, businessmen, at all levels adheres first and foremost to the principles of honesty and integrity. In addition, a way of life based on patience, perseverance, diligence, wisdom, and prudence is indispensable to create balance and be able to cope appropriately with critical challenges arising from extensive and rapid socioeconomic, environmental, and cultural change in the world. Sufficiency economy can be summarized in the following way. The sufficiency economy is an approach to life and conduct which is applicable at every level, from the individual through the family and community to the management and development of the nation. It promotes a middle way especially at developing the economy to keep up with the world in the era of globalization. Sufficiency has three key principles. Moderation, wisdom or insight, and the need for built-in resilience against the risk which arise from internal or external changes. In addition, those applying these principles must value knowledge, integrity, and honesty and conduct their lives with perseverance, toleration, wisdom, and insight. A true Buddhist life. The key spirit of sufficient economy, the middle way, is not a mere philosophical ideology, but it is reflected in all aspects of human life, that is social, political, economic, and psychological, and so on. The pragmatism of the middle way in our daily practice simply means reasoned, moral self-discipline. Relating to economy, it is obvious that world economy is heavily polarized to a certain extremism. Consequently, we are suffering from the economy which does not concern in reasoned moral self-discipline. In layman term, the key of economy is human desire, which are two types. They are unlimited desire that is aimed for material desire, and disciplined desire, that is aimed for a quality life. Capitalist economy, which devours the world economy at present, 
is subservient to the institution of unlimited desire. Thus, the mainstream economy only focuses on efficiency in production. It is a kind of extremism leading to competition, snatching, exploitation, human fight, suffering, social violence, and destroy peace and prosperity. The consequence is an extremity, always in a worse direction, though. It lacks well, it lacks the break to keep it on the middle way. The sufficiency economy is a type of economy with reason, moral self-discipline. It is an economy based on disciplined desire. It is an economy based on compassion for others and environment. It is an economy based on sustenance of mankind and earth. It is an economy allows you to enjoy life in happiness and well-being with moderation, simply by neither encouraging you to force your mind to a certain extremity, nor to please your desire to a certain extremity. It is a well-balanced life, a well-balanced economy. This economy is eco-friendly and leading to a happier life. The key concept is the wise moderation in consumption, ideology, lifestyle, and so on. The true life of the middle way. Therefore, the sustainable economy talks about the efficiency in consumption rather than efficiency in production. The sufficiency economy is an alternative economy, producing not only individual mental happiness, but a well-balanced economic growth of business as well. Sufficient economy does not reject either economic theories or economic progress. Neither does it denounce globalization, as some have tried to interpret. Instead, the middle way the king of Thailand speaks to a lifestyle governed by moderation and resiliency. On 26 May 2006, the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan presented a Human Development Lifetime Achievement Awards to King Pumipon Adulaya Date. He said, His Majesty's sufficiency economy philosophy is of a great relevance to communities everywhere during these times of rapid globalization. The philosophy's middle way approach strongly reinforced the United Nations' own advocacy of a people-centered and sustainable path towards human development. His Majesty's development agenda and visionary thinking are an inspiration to his subjects and to people everywhere. Therefore, the sufficiency economy is a set of tools and principles that help communities, corporations, and government manage globalization, maximizing its benefits and minimizing its cost by making wise decisions that promote sustainable development, equity, and resilience against shocks. As such, the sufficient economy is a much needed survival strategy in a world of economic uncertainty and environmental threats. We believe that sufficient economy principles are applicable around the world, especially for rapidly developing countries that are experiencing some of the same pressures as Thailand, said Joanna Marlin Scholitz, UNDP resident representative and UN resident coordinator in Thailand. This is a set of tools that can be used by government, civil society, and individuals to work towards sustainable growth, environmental protection, and a better quality of life for all. Sufficient economy is a practical way of living towards sustainable development because it deals with the three basic principles. Learning to know when it is sufficient, learning to live by rationale and reasonableness, and learning to live with immunity. Learning to know when it is sufficient is to know when the need is satisfied. This is how to stop making unnecessary excess while at the same time not to underspend. One invests and spends in accordance with one's ability to do so without overdoing or underdoing. Learning to live by rationale and reasonableness is to reason or rationalize before one takes the action. One invests, spends in accordance with one's own ability because 
one has ensured oneself of and satisfy oneself with a reasonableness test. One is to resist being led by greed and unbounded desire for higher and higher profits. Learning to live with immunity is to ensure that once one has spent or invested any unexpected or anticipated incident in the future can still be adequately covered. This is a clear example of living one's life based on the Buddhist middle path in a real practical term. His Majesty's sufficiency economy shall be what the world is looking for in a global search to devise the governments that, uh, to devise the governance that could prevent further economic crisis that derive from excess and greed, unreasonableness and unbounded desire to maximize benefits return, beneficial returns. His Majesty's sufficiency economy is what the world is looking for to make sure that sustainable development will be achieved in a meaningful way for our future generations. Buddhism is summarized under the term middle path. Canonically, it is the middle way between two false views, indulgence and asceticism. However, the middle way is not mere philosophical ideology, but it is reflected in all aspects of human life, that is, social, political, economic, and psychological, and so on. The pragmatism of the middle path simply means reasoned moral self-discipline, or to have mindfulness and awareness of the body, which neither ignores it nor try to forcefully master it. Simply, it is neither to force nor to please one's mind or desire. Therefore, the middle path can apply in any circumstances of life. Most importantly, this idea of well-balanced life is not a religious-driven lifestyle. Therefore, it goes beyond religious affiliations. In fact, the Buddha never claimed that his teaching were his invention at all and as a religion. His teachings are basically pointing out, in Thai called Te Sana or Te, of the existing truth of the world and human nature. The benefit of this ideology can be experienced by practitioner himself without a belief. After all, the Buddha means to realize, not to believe. Therefore, the sufficiency economy is an alternative economy producing not only individual mental happiness, but a well-balanced economic growth of business as well. There is a clear example from the study of the gross national happiness, as I quoted above, that Kingdom of Bhutan, that it not only produces happier society, but desirable growth of gross domestic product as well. In fact, the core of G and H is another version of sufficiency economy. Therefore, morally well-balanced economy is not relevant to religious adherence, but human wisdom to produce a win-win situation between mankind and global resources. It is the sowing of compassion and having responsibility for our own generation and future generations to come. It is a type of economy that does not encourage one to be selfish or self-centered so that we won't steal and exploit what belongs to our future generations. Contentment is another word in Buddhism widely used, and it's a crucial ingredient of sustainability. Although it is difficult to grasp and always mis misunderstood, contentment is a satisfaction with what you get. It is the neurophysiological uh, neuro experience of satisfaction and being at ease in one's situation. In a Buddhist sense, it is the freedom from anxiety, want or need. Contentment is the goal behind all goals because once achieved, there is nothing to seek until it is lost. In other words, contentment simply means a well-balanced life or life of a middle path. There are three types of contentment. One, contentment with what one gets and deserves to get. Two, contentment 
with what is within one's strength or capacity, and three, contentment with what is befitting. From a Buddhist perspective, it is clear that contentment does not mean to suppress the human urge to gain physical wealth, mental happiness, and so on. Contentment is the mental pacifying process as a result of extremism. It is not to be content for causes, but consequences. This is clear from the Buddha's advice on division of one's rightfully, rightfully earned money. On one part, he say, he, on one part, he should live on and do his duty towards others. With two parts, he should expand his business and he should save the fort for a rainy days. Therefore, Buddha never asks a businessman to be contained in investment, but he encourages sustainable investment. Therefore, contentment is a wisdom and source of well-balanced life. In fact, the idea behind sustainability or self-sufficiency economy is to be mindful of mindful of all foreseeable and unforeseeable consequences of human actions. Sufficient economy is not anti-globalization, anti-mega projects, and anti-liberal market policies at all, as some may think in that way. On the contrary, sufficient economy encourages us to wisely ruminate on over all aspects of globalization, mega projects, and liberal market policies instead of just aiming at one-dimensional consequences. Sufficient economy produces a well-balanced physical and mental development. After all, the essence of man is the integration of body and mind. Therefore, the development should be based on balance consequence of both physical comfort and mental happiness. A proper application of sufficient economy teaches us to be responsible for projects and policies, whether it is a global, national, organizational, and individual. In order to get to sustainability, we think we should start it from our ethics. As a result, we have developed everything to ethics. These days, we hear about environmental ethics, business ethics, and social ethics, etc. These subjects are taught widely in university courses, hoping that if we have proper ethics to lead our life, we can get to the sustainable lifestyle. In this process, the problem is our understanding of the ethics itself. In the past, ethics were der derived from moral and religious grounds. Once religions fell its role in the society, the ethics lost its grip from religion. We encourage secular ethics, but still have a nature of divine order. Unfortunately, we considered our greed, hatred, conceit, etc. as part of human nature. Therefore, to restrain this human nature, we create ethics. Restraining means we are forcing against our own will. Therefore, most ethics become theory rather than manifesting it in our behavior. It becomes a matter of compromise between human greed and sustainability, which conflict in itself. Accordingly, the outcome is always unsustainability. On the contrary, while a Buddhist perspective consider greed, hatred, conceit, etc. as a part of human nature as well, uh, as well, but see it as a rectifiable human nature. Nature of humanity is able to be trained and able to reimagine for perspective on resilient future. In other words, we can reimagine our conditions, limitations, needs, and greed. With ability of reimagine, we can then set up our ethics for action with full awareness and willingly, not against the grains like most ethics we are familiar with. We change ethics to our virtues and wisdom, so they become part of new us in this age of sustainability. I would like to outline here some of the, four, some of the Buddhist foundations of how do we perceive our sustainable world. At least there are four, four foundations. The one, 
Buddhism sees that everything in this earth is existed, nature, and it operates according to the law of causality. Human is just a part of this natural law of causality. Human beings are part of nature, just like any other creatures or environment. Two, being a part of natural law of causality, what human acts does have direct repercussions to other parts of natural law. Equally, any changes in nature does have direct impact upon human life, both internally and externally, as well as on relationship between human and nature. Three, unlike other creatures, human is a creature of evol evolvability, but can be fully tamed or developed. Accordingly, we prescribe many ethical practices for human to develop. Ethics is an education through which we develop our quality of intact humanity. We can develop ourselves to be a noble human being who can attain true independence and happiness. Four, one potentiality a well-developed human being is able to change unsustainability to interdependence, integrated and well-balanced sustainability. Once we use the, those Buddhist principles or worldview as a foundation for building a sustainable society, we can clearly see the differences between Western notion of sustainable development and Buddhist notion of sustainable development. While Western sustainable development merely emphasizes on external factors of economy, environment, and society, the Buddhist sustainable development look at holistic, integrated, and balanced factors of human development to go hand in hand. This human come sustainable development is only possible through the full process of human development. It can be developed by relating wisdom and ethics through mental qualities. In other words, how we relate a human with society, self, and spirituality. In other words, the middle path. Be the Buddhist middle path or temporal sustainable development. Both have its foundation on triad development, ethics, that is popularly known in Buddhism as sila, mental qualities, samadhi, and wisdom, that is panya. In a pragmatic formula, to achieve a Buddhist sustainability, one needs to accomplish sustainable speech, action, and economy, that is ethical development of life, or another word is a sila. As a basic foundation in order to develop sustainable effort, mindfulness, and determination, that is a mental development of people, a samadhi. This will enhance our spiritual development by developing a sustainable perceptions and intention, that is a panya. In another word, the sustainable development is in fact no other than the Buddhist noble eightfold path, through which one achieves the perfection of life and perspective on a resilient future. The middle path is the equality in between three values. They are moderation, reasonableness, and self-immunity. In other words, it is the very tried of society, self, and spirituality, or sila, samadhi, and panya. This type of Buddhist sustainability is then can truly call full sustainable development amidst the nature of unsustainability. This is what we call nirvana or happiness. That is why Buddhist attitude of sustainability start with daily greetings of how are you? And you would confidently reply, I am sustainable. As a reminding note, I would say that Buddhist happiness is another synonym of sustainability. Etymologically, sustainable was first used in 1610s to mean bearable. Similarly, Buddhist happiness, or sukha, or suk in Thai, also etymo etymologically means bearable, or feeling of ease. Unlike Western notion of happiness, which lies on external factors rather than inner factors, etymologically English term happiness is derived from the term hap in the late 14th century, which simply means luck or fortune. Which, one, which lies outside of self. Therefore, you always pursue for happiness. Instead of finding the happiness 
inside you, you're always pursuing outside of you. Therefore, a Buddhist happiness is indeed the quality we develop as a human being, to able to tolerate and adjust oneself to new conditions all the time without going through any pain and enforcement, having a new life all the time, a life of a better life. It is not kind of happiness, conditions under any compromises, but it is a sustainable happiness, one attain via well-balanced human action. Buddha, therefore, compares a well-developed sustainability to a type of relationship developed between self and society. As a bee consumes nectar out of flower, the Buddha says, as a bee, without harming the blossoms, its color, its fragrance, takes its nectar and flies away, so should the sage grow through villages. This self-beneficial relationship without harming opposites should be the crucial essence of sustainability. This model of interdependency should be promoted between human and environment as well as all creatures who share this planet with us. This is the heart of Buddhist sustainability, or in other words, a Buddhist approach of sustainable development. Let us build a culture of saying, I am sustainable in speech, in actions, and thought, every time we greet each other with the phrase, how are you? Thank you for your attention. <laughs>